Before we get into the video, I just want to say, hey, thanks for watching. Also, this video is split into two parts. This one, a look into Arcane's Jinx, and one coming out later, The Psychology of Jinx. The video ends kind of abruptly, and that's because I just ran out of time editing, that's why it's split into two. Because I talk about Jinx growing up, this video has a lot of spoilers for Act 1 of Arcane, which are the first three episodes. If you mind spoilers, watch those three episodes before watching this one, and I'll catch you later. If you're all set, let's get into the video. Content warning for depictions of violence and viewer discretion is advised. I'm sure you've heard by now that League of Legends, the most popular video game in the world, finally has an animated series on Netflix called Arcane. For gamers everywhere, this show was a hit. For regular people just scrolling through Netflix, this show was a hit. You can tell from League of Legends cinematic shorts that Riot's creative team puts their all into the work they create, and this show was a wonderful compilation of the skills they've harnessed throughout the years. Arcane has amazing fight scene choreography and a storyline that moves along with incredible pace. The story follows a few characters that you can play in League of Legends. Vi, Piltover's enforcer, Jinx, the loose cannon, Echo, the boy savior, Caitlyn, the sheriff of Piltover, Victor, the sensitive cat boy, Jace, the defender of tomorrow, and many other characters that appear both in-game and some that are brand new. Specifically, the show catalogs their lives growing up and how they came to be the champions you see in-game. Arcane only has 9 episodes as of recording, and Season 2 is set to release in 2023. While we have this lowly void in time where the only updates we see from Riot are champion skins for League and gun skins for Valorant, I thought it might be fun to dissect Arcane's characters, or more specifically, character. I'm sure you've heard already how great the fight scenes are, the importance of camera movement during otherwise still scenes, how great the fight scenes are, the beauty of an underlying canon sound relationship, and seriously, the fight scenes are fucking fantastic. But throughout the entire series, there's a singular character that caught my eye the most. Sure, I paid attention to the rest of the series, but when she came onto screen, I would sit up in my chair and watch intently, looking at flickers on the screen to see if it tells me more about her personality, or better yet, what's going on in her head. Jinx is the main antagonist in Arcane, but it's not that obvious in the beginning. I'd like to walk you through Jinx's mind, her life story, and how she came to be in the mental anguish that she's in now. It's important in character studies to take in the full context and every detail of major life events, but this is a YouTube video. I'll try to be concise without dragging it out. So without further ado, let's jump in. Episode 1 opens with Violet and Powder, Jinx's given name after losing their parents in a revolution gone wrong. We see Vander, the man who led the revolution, take the two girls into his arms and carry them back to a much sadder, quieter zone. The next scene opens up on a group of tweens getting ready to run a heist. Powder and older sister Violet or Vi and Vander's two sons, Clagger and Milo, stand on top of a rooftop and overlook the city of Piltover. As a citizen of Zon, the underground, Powder knows she has to be stronger than she physically is to make it around in one piece. Unfortunately, this is easier said than done, considering her best tends to put her and her siblings into the worst situations. The kids reach the luxurious apartment that they're heisting and proceed to pickpocket various items. Powder notices a box that stores shiny blue crystals and manages to pocket some of them. The owner of the apartment, Jace, gets back in time to notice that someone broke in, and as the kids rush to leave the apartment, one of Powder's blueberries falls and destroys the apartment complex with one resounding explosion. They get chased by enforcers in a scene that brilliantly world builds by showing the cool gadgets the enforcers use and the layout of Piltover, a city that sits on top of Zon. The kids are able to get back to Zon in one piece, but once centering, the group gets hassled by a blonde kid who shows interest in their bag full of stolen items. His gang comes out and the two groups squabble. Powder ends up getting a hold of the bag and is chased to appear. She attempts to use her handmade explosives, but they end up failing like they always do, forcing her to scramble for a way to get out of the situation. So she throws the bag of goods into the lake and runs. Vi is quick to forgive Powder for her bad fight or flight reflex, but Milo is not as forgiving and makes comments on her lack of skill, calling her a jinx to all the missions they go on. Surely this comment won't bother Powder at all. The camera showcases Zon in a stark contrast to Piltover. Zon is darker and more grunge-like, with green hues scattering the area. The music that accompanies the tour of Zon, Playground by B.M. Miller, is a funky pop-punk song, while the music used during the run through Piltover was orchestrated and whimsical. After Vander confronts his kids about the incident, he visits his friend Benzo to converse with him about what had happened and his concerns for his kids. Enforcers continue to look for them, and stop by Benzo's shop to ask them to turn the culprits in. Vander solemnly denies to do so. Back in their personal junkyard, Vi is practicing on a boxing dummy and gets a high score. Powder shows Milo and the audience that she's a better shot than he is at half his age. In fact, her aim is so precise that she tags every single dummy in the heart and head areas multiple times while Milo misses every single shot. The kids seem to be distracting themselves well, but enforcers are still on their tail and they only barely make it out of their grasp. Vander spends the rest of his time hiding his kids from several enforcer raids with a few close calls happening in the process. Vi decides that the best thing she can do is give up herself to the enforcers to protect her younger siblings, but Vander and Benzo catch her, and instead Vander plans to turn himself in and locks Vi in the cellar so that she can't interfere. The enforcers come down to arrest Vander, putting him in handcuffs, but then... 
Pause. So I may have forgotten to mention the blonde kid from earlier who was really interested in their loot. Remember him? Yeah. Well, he belongs to a drug overlord named Silco. Silco uses him to test the effects of his drug Shimmer, which makes him into a giant rare human-like beast. Rewind. So the rare human-like beast kills the lead enforcer and Benzo. Then it knocks out Vander, and Silco pays off Marcus, the second in command enforcer. Silco has been using Marcus to get Vander to him, and it's revealed later that this fascination comes from Silco and Vander's relationship as brothers, a relationship that turns sour. Silco walks off with Vander, unaware that Vaya had seen everything from the window of the cellar. Echo eventually opens the door for her, and through tears tells her that he saw them go to an old warehouse. Vaya goes back to her home, Milo, Clagger, and Powder all happy to see her. She tells them what she saw, and they agree to go out and help Vander together. Powder gets ready to go, but then Vaya stops her. Although she had previously been ready and willing to let Powder help, and forgives her mistake as they go, she urges Powder to stay. Powder argues, but Vi adamantly tells her that she isn't ready. This all comes from a place of love and concern for her sister's safety, but from Powder's naive standpoint, it comes off as a confirmation of her deepest insecurities. Vi, Milo, and Clagger go to the warehouse to save Vander, and then Powder has a breakdown. This breakdown scene is a good representation of a child with an insecure attachment style, with no healthy coping mechanisms, showing Powder having a tantrum with no positive way to get out her frustration at being left by her main caretaker, Violet. She lets out her anger in fits of hitting, shouting, and destruction. In her frustration, she realizes that the blue crystals she had pocketed were the reason for the apartment complex's destruction, and in a moment of epiphany, she says, I can help them. Meanwhile, Milo is picking the locks at Vander's wrists and legs while Vi is solo fighting Silco's entire team to buy them time. Silco gives his boy more shimmer to transform him, proving to be too much for Vi to take and sends her retreating to Vander's cell. The scenes of Vander's escape are cut with scenes of Powder's journey to the warehouse when she finally makes it to an open window. She sees Vi struggle to fight against the werehuman and reveals her newest invention, a monkey bomb strapped with three of the blueberries even though one was enough to take down an entire apartment complex. The monkey takes a few long steps towards the werehuman, clashes it and then an explosion. Penta kill. Vander, barely alive, consumes some shimmer and uses the last of his energy to escape with Vi out of the burning building. In his final breath, Vander asks Vi to continue taking care of Powder and then dies. As Vi is trying to grasp at the death of her entire family, Powder comes into the alleyway, excited to share her victory with her sister. Vi is dreadful at the sudden notice that this whole scenario was caused by Powder, and for the first time slaps her. Powder doesn't understand how things could have turned out so wrong or why Vi was yelling at her. Vi firmly says, Because you're a jinx! Do you hear me? Milo was right! <laughs> and abandons Powder in the alleyway. Silco, still alive, spots Vander's body and a small crying figure next to it. He gets out a knife, assumedly going to take her out. Silco slowly walks up to Powder, asking her where her sister had gone. To his surprise, Powder jumps at him for a hug and exclaims that she was abandoned, that Violet isn't her sister anymore. Silco relates his relationship between his brother, Vander, to the now broken relationship between Powder and Violet and decides to take her in as his own daughter. Oh no, I'm sure a moment this traumatic and another sudden change in housing will have no effects on the psychosocial development of an 11-year-old girl. Oh my god. a seven year time skip, we finally see Powder grown up. She's protecting a cargo ship full of Shimmer. A group called the Firelights invaded the ship to try and destroy the Shimmer on deck. While fighting them off, Jinx comes face to face with a pink haired Firelight girl who vaguely resembles her long lost sister, Violet. Jinx freezes and her demeanor changes as she questions this person's identity. Lights flicker on the screen and brief flashbacks of Jinx's memory plays with marks drawn over faces and her brain short circuits while she searches in the eyes of the stranger for someone who isn't there. The pink haired girl makes a sudden movement and Jinx instantly shoots. You see her for a second consider that she may have just shot and killed her older sister. Another firelight makes a sudden movement and Jinx pulls out her machine gun, firing at anything that moves. The music crescendos as her bullets impale inanimate objects, and even after the remaining firelights escape, Jinx doesn't stop until she's out of ammunition. The violins hold out their last note as the gun barrel focuses at the corpse of the pink-haired girl. This is Jinx. 